I work for a charity that supports young people aged 14 to 25. And they can be vulnerable, creative, marginalized, musical, exploited, gifted, funny, sad, lonely, can have mental health problems, are none of those things, sometimes all of those things, and often more. In this space here today, I'm surrounded by people who perhaps aren't so young, some of you who certainly are not young, <laughs> and perhaps quite a few, myself included, who still occasionally behave as though they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but because of that age demographic, it's probably relatively easy for most of us to recall a world without most or all of the following. The internet, social media, mobile phones, 24-hour news, reality TV, and Netflix. So what did we do? Were we bored? Yes, sometimes we were, and that's okay. But what we did have in the absence of all of those things was the space and freedom to be young. The space and freedom to be creative, the space and freedom to make mistakes, to be clumsy and awkward, the space and freedom to fall off walls, out of trees, out of favor, in and out of love and into trouble. And that's a very important thing to have. And within that space, we had an imperfect but necessary unwritten right for all the fears and foibles and embarrassments of our youth to be forgotten by almost everybody but ourselves confined to a memory in the deep recesses of our minds that would simply fade over time. So we had that space, and within that space, we had the unfettered aspiration to be better than the past, to be better than our forebears. All around us, there were iconic moments that were indicating to us that the future was going to be bright. We could see the space race, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the defeat of apartheid in South Africa, LGBT rights coming to the fore, and the end of corporal punishment. It was going to be great. We were going to be better or unlike our parents. And when it came to parenting, we were going to be better than that as well. We were so sure of our brilliance and potential betterness that we're almost metaphorically on the verge of erecting statues to that before we'd actually achieved anything. The age gap, the generation gap between us and our children was going to be marginal. Our children were going to have an upbringing that would eclipse everything that had gone before it. Because we got it. We would never forget what it was like to be young. And we didn't forget what it was like to be young, but only what it was like to be young for us. And then our generation, as life often does, was thrown two curveballs that we never saw coming. Two curveballs that squeezed the space and shackled the freedom that we had taken for granted. The first of those curveballs was social media, the rise of the platforms. The space that we had enjoyed and the freedom from the bullies and the clique of the popular kids that began with schools out on a Friday afternoon and lasted all weekend until Monday morning assembly is gone. The bullies and the cliques are there 24 seven courtesy of social media, a constant dripping tap of judgmental intimidation. The awkwardness and acne that made us feel self-conscious and uncomfortable has actually exiled young people in the face of a constant barrage of soft focus photoshopped imagery from the lives of the beautiful, the privileged, and the self-obsessed. It has created an exile for those young people that may be virtual, 
but unfortunately the mental health impact of that is all too real. Bullying, that behaviour, is nothing new. It's always been around. There's not much difference between online bullying in a group chat and a pile of young people cramming into a phone box back in the day to make a prank phone call. The only difference is the freedom to get away from it. Again, that lack of space. Older people say to younger people, put down your phone. Don't engage with social media, just leave it alone. And that's an important and healthy thing to do. But asking a 16-year-old not to look at their phone is like asking the 16-year-old version of you not to look out the window at a street fight. The second curveball that we were thrown that squeezed that space and shackled that freedom was the change to the education system. The narrative around the pursuit of academic excellence was littered with celestial references, a star, star pupil, reach for the stars. But then given that, that drive for excellence has resulted in 40,000 teachers quitting education in 2016 alone, and a third of newly qualified teachers quitting education before they've reached the five-year landmark in their career, it would indicate that there's more than a hint of fool's gold glitter about this A-star league table obsessed system. A system that is so toxic that those educated, capable, intelligent adults change their entire life pathway to get away from it, citing mental health and stress as one of the, some of the primary reasons why they leave. So, if it's damaging those people to that extent, what is it doing to our young people? We know, where I work, what it's doing to young people, and we created the space for them to express how they felt about education. They are the early survivors of the opening salvos of an educational war of attrition that is waged without their well-being and mental health well-being at its heart. It is, <clears throat> it is being waged in a way where inclusion is a sacrificial lamb and young people who do not fit are uneducated collateral damage. But they are not uneducated. They are supremely educated in the reasons why it failed. So we created a space for them to express how they felt about their time. And once they'd vented their frustrations, they began to do something wonderful. They wanted to come up with ideas of how they could fix it. And we were blown away by that. And one of the things they came up with is that they wanted us to help them and empower them to push legislators to insist that every seat of learning in the country have somebody on their board of governors who had a young person in their 20s or 30s who had been failed by education. And their job would be to ensure that there was space and freedom created for those who did not fit. And we thought that was an amazing thing. It really, really did surprise us. And will probably surprise you when I tell you that youth provision is not statutory. There is no legal obligation for government or local authorities to provide space and freedom in our communities for young people. So perhaps another thing you can do is contact your MP. Ask them if they can do something about that. We did, here locally, and our local MP, Emma Hardy, picked it up and has taken it on as a cause. So you can do the same. There is, Shakespeare once said, there is the salt of youth within all of us. An echo down through the years from the young person that you all once were. It is barely audible. But I implore you to listen to it. If you listen closely, you will hear it. And you will remember how you felt when you were young, when you were perhaps confused or angry or isolated or upset or anxious. And you will have promised to yourself that when you were an adult, and if it was at all within your power to do anything about it, that you would and create the space and freedom that you had. So be true 
to that promise. Be true to the young version of you. Stick up for that young version of you by sticking up for the young people of today. And wherever you can, try and create that space and freedom that we all took for granted and has been denied to them. The final part of my talk is very much in keeping with how we work. We try to empower young people. So the final words are not going to come from me. They're not going to come from any other adult. They're going to come from a 16-year-old young woman called Jodie Langford, for whom we created the space for her to express how she felt about Brexit. Something she was denied the opportunity to influence one way or the other because she was simply too young to vote. But it's something that she felt really strongly about it. And this is what she said. What's the deal? What's the deal with hiding our undisclosed future behind a six letter word? She starts her morning with sunny side up eggs on whole wheat bread. He is unable to get up until the afternoon, spends his morning in bed, and while she's attaching her Sorosky earrings that beam like spotlights, leading her into a solo act of poverty pride pliers and tax avoiding turnouts, he's too afraid to move his feet, not wanting to tiptoe into the soul destroying performance of a young man's tragedy. In the interval, they can be found staring into dressing room mirrors. The lady posting passive aggressive political tweets, he's reading from the back of a crumpled up receipt, rehearsing the same lines out loud prior to his 22nd job interview. Why do you want to work here? The thing is, I don't but my postgraduate plans plummeted and in order to just get by I need to dream of a life where I live and not just survive. People will make assumptions on the position I'm taking due to the colour of my skin or my ethnic origin. He ain't British. Where do you see yourself five years from now? He gulps. His eyes pulse around the room looking for a clue. He's broke at 22 in five years. He might be through and before he knows it to be true from the right wing, he's thrown to center stage. Turning to the audience, he absorbs their humiliating sympathy. In five, I'll wake up dead or in this dead end job where I'll still be living off ready meals and retail reductions. A life as dramatic as a West End production, my relationships won't function because I can't afford the beds that straighten out my head because it'll have put the NHS in the fate of our pockets. He paces down stage. The weight of my debt, wrecking ball, will smash through the buildings of businesses I grew up with. And the crane driver, the thief of nostalgia, are there any questions you wish to ask me? Um, yeah, who bought my destiny and threw it on a shelf? Who charged me for my intellect and prospers in their wealth? Who thought of the idea to bestir our nation with fear? And who thought we would stay silent? We can't ignore the eviction notices through our doors and the minus in our bank accounts. They'd be daft to believe we haven't got something to shout about. You've made a division in the seas. Unlike Moses, you displease. And how can our kingdom be united if we turn our backs on union? Mrs. Prime Minister, how could you let things get so sinister? Thank you.